Hello, everyone. My name is Darren Pierre, and uh, I'm teaching feature engineering this today. So first thing I would like you to do is imagine you're a data scientist or a machine learning engineer. And your job is to create a model that classifies fruits, depending on the color, what kind of the shape, and those are kind of the features that they give you. So what this company that you work for is trying to do is trying to whenever they have an app where you just scan a fruit and it's able to classify whether it's an apple, banana, or an orange. So you decide on the model that you're picking and you test it out. And you get a 75% accuracy. Good, but not good enough. You're getting paid top dollar and the company wants to see more. So what can you do? One is try to try a better model, but you search and search and search and you find out the model that you're currently using was the best one. So the second option would be kind of to give up, but we're, we are Ravens and we don't give up. So the third option is feature engineering. And this is what this, um, this, this is what this workshop is all about. All right. So feature engineering, workshop by case. So today's agenda. So pretty much for the first step of the workshop, I'll be kind of doing it through these slides through the, this presentation, and then we'll head on to Kaggle and see how we would do them on like a real, um, on a real data set that you may or may not, well, you will encounter. So definitely we're gonna uh, tackle common problems like how do we um, encode categorical data, numeric data, or date related data. So yeah, let's get started. So, what is feature engineering? So, what's what's what? Uh, what do you guys think feature engineering is? CRT. See the chat. Uh -oh. Any any responses? No. Nothing. So, feature engineering. It's pretty much the process of kind of transforming raw data into features that will better represent the knowledge that your model will need in order to predict some value or some kind of classification. So there's a definition that Dr. Jason Rowley kind of introduced. Um, so what I like to think about it is kind of feature engineering is some kind of representation problem where your kind of goal is to, you have a set of features, and you're trying to transform, manipulate the data set in some sort of way that your model can easily more um, kind of digest it and kind of learn features in order to kind of predict what it's trying to do. It's an editor process and that requires domain knowledge and intuition. So what do I mean by that? So basically, um, for each kind of problem, it kind of kind of um, has some kind of domain knowledge into it. So maybe if you're a doctor and you're trying to build a, a machine learning classifier that kind of predicts based on like CT scans, based on some organ of the body, you would have some kind of knowledge on it so that potentially that could be helpful for this model that you would like to introduce. For me, um, I'm, a, I'm a sports fan. I love basketball. So maybe if we want to, um, we want to build some sort of classifier that kind of predicts whether a team wins or not. Definitely one thing you would want to uh, use as a feature would be turnovers. Definitely the type of players that each and um, every player or teacher what, what type of players that each team has, and also potentially injuries and like past performances. And definitely it's not 
you just encode the features and then you're done. It's an iterative process where you do some trial and error and then so through that you find a, find the a good set of features that are good for your model. So definitely this fe uh, feature engineer, it's kind of a large scope per se, where it kind of encompasses a lot of kind of daily activities. So things like feature generation. So what feature generation is, is kind of, kind of ge generating a new feature based on the raw data that you have. And we'll future on, um, later on this presentation, we'll uh, see an example of that. Feature transformation, that kind of is where you have a raw feature and you're transforming it into another feature. So an example of this would be, let's say you have a, a skewed kind of distribution for one of your features. So one of, the, one of the ways to make it into a normal distribution um, would be performing a, a logarithmic on each of on that certain column. Another thing is feature selection. So pretty much feature selection is it's somewhat what it entails, where you're trying to find the best set of features for your kind of given problem. And then feature analysis is where you kind of um, you kind of see the interaction between these features. Um, for your given problem and then feature evaluation is pretty much detailing how important is this feature. So before I move on, is there any questions? If not, let's move on. Oh, and then there's um, kind of an, another definition where applied machine learning is basically a feature engineer by Professor Andrew NG. So he's he's probably a well-known professor throughout um, kind of this machine learning um, landscape where you guys probably taking a course in Coursera or see some YouTube, YouTube videos. So why should I care about Feature Engineer? So why should you care? So one we already discussed improves the models prediction but it's also kind of the primary reason why either your machine learning project fails or succeeds so pretty much uh, another reason is that we want to have understandable features it definitely um, a big thing in machine learning is explainable ai so uh, what that entails is that you want to know why a certain model has made that certain prediction so then when things go wrong or things of kind of in terms of ethical concerns, you see why the model uh, um, predicts that certain value or that certain class. So this is kind of important because you don't want to have um, some companies or kind of what depending on what organization you work for, um, you definitely want to know why a certain model does a certain thing instead of kind of doing a black box. And then thirdly, um, thirdly, it's computationally expensive to store and run all the features in your data set. So de de depending on the problem, you may have a large amount of data and it's really expensive for you to kind of compute the cost. Well, kind of for your model to be training all that features and trying to predict on those features. So an example would be the, let's say the MBA. The NBA kind of stores all sorts of stats in terms of the player's kind of performance, their kind of physiological levels, their, their games. So definitely like how many points they scored, the rebounds, steals. So definitely you can imagine these data sets are quite large. So definitely um, using feature selection would be a great kind of use case for you to um kind of solve this problem where you have a bunch of features and you're trying to find the best common set for your problem lastly <clears throat> models can't really process raw features and we'll see example where in my kaggle kind of notebook where i try to run uh try where i try to train a model and uh, it gives me an error 
So it can't, uh, it can't process raw features such as text, dates, and categorical data. So um, feature types. So I just want to kind of give what kind of features you may expect. So we're definitely under the scope of tabular data where things are in a column in a row. So in a tabular data set, um, each, each column will be considered a feature, and then each row we consider an instance. So an example of the model uh, of like the problem you're trying to solve. So we could have binary features such as, such as being absent for a class or present or even absent and pre or present for my lecture. Um, heads or tails, so that's two sides of a coin. Um, another thing would be sex, whether you're born as male or female, and all sorts of things you can probably imagine. The next, we have categorical features. So these don't really have a number associ associated to them. So these can be a color or a search size. So even you think about color, we have all sorts of color, blue, red, green, white, black, and then sh shirt size. Um, we definitely have small, medium, large, extra large, you name it. Next, we got discrete features. So these features don't necessarily have like a, a decimal point to them. They're kind of a whole number. So example will be in our kind of um, Kaggle competition where we have COVID cases where you, do, you can't have like three and a half cases. You can only have like a whole number, four or five or six. Maybe the number of students that attend this workshop. And you probably can think of some more. Lastly, we've got continuous features. So definitely money or time. So definitely you can have like five dollars and fifty cents. And then time, you know, an hour and a half. Um, an hour and uh, like three minutes. Then you can go in nanoseconds and smaller and smaller. So then <clears throat> you guys are probably wondering what makes a good feature? So this is something you would um, kind of go across when you're kind of doing your EDA. So that's explore, exploratory data analysis where the goal is trying to find correlations between independent and dependent variables and kind of see the trends between them. So they kind of give you an idea after that analysis, um, general uh, kind of guide you towards your kind of feature engineering or generating kind of step. So we first, what makes a good feature? It has to be available. It's kind of simple. The feature is uh, defined for as many of instances as possible. So definitely it has to be there for the majority, but it's still OK that if there's some missing parts in terms of for, let's say, an instance, we have five people and then um, we're, uh, we're using features of maybe the height, the weight, and then maybe their shoe size. And let's say their shoe size for two people, the, the data is missing. We can still work with that, and that's one of the kind of the realms of data data engineering it's called data imputation so it's kind of dealing with with missing data and how you deal with that there's various techniques um unfortunately we won't be covering it because there's so much to t talk about but i can kind of give you a glimpse of what to make some techniques so basically you can put the mean or the median or the most occurring kind of shoe size there's using a classifier called K nearest neighbor, where you try to compute the most similar person to it or most similar instance, and you fill that um, shoe size in, and you can go on for that on and on for days. Next thing is discriminant. So pretty much the feature divides the instance into the, the different target classes or co correlates with a div uh, with a target variable. 
So pretty much what I'm trying to say in this case is where um, it's um, we need a feature that can definitely um, it's indicative of the like all the classes and it's unique for all the classes. So definitely, um, let's say maybe shoe size and you're trying to predict how tall a person is. Um, I think definitely a shoe size would be great. So based on my estimation, um, people with bigger shoe sizes will be generally taller than people with smaller shoe sizes. But maybe I, I could be wrong. Definitely uh, someone may prove me wrong on that. So and yeah. And so there, lastly, it must be informative. So it's somewhat related to our discriminated kind of property where it describes something that kind of makes sense to human eye, uh, kind of in human intuition. So and yeah. So now I would like to kind of explain the feature engineering process. So the first step, so this is something you may want to do and consider. Definitely it's not like a de facto, de facto like process. You can definitely like jump in without doing some steps in here, but this is what I feel will yield the best results in a, in a structured manner. So the first step is understanding the data. <clears throat> what do I mean by understanding the data? I want, um, you definitely want to know how, what, each feature means and how is it collected and the various kind of levels to it in terms of um, let's say I have um, let's say I have countries and I want to see how many countries I have because depending how many countries I have I'll definitely want to use some kind of different categorical encoder because having a lot of countries can be problematic where you want to store all of that. So maybe something like a feature hasher will be the best to use in this case. And uh, yeah. So the second step is brainstorming I, I features. So pretty much kind of step one was pretty much an EDA process where you try to, you know, you understand the data and then you kind of see some correlation. So then from there you want to use the insight and um, from the uh, from what you learn and kind of brainstorm kind of features that you think will be good for your model. So then next you want to select from uh, kind of from your set of brainstorm uh, features what would be the best and what would uh, kind of uh, to lead you towards the kind of the best yielding result. Fourth, you want to evaluate the model. You want to see how well it did giving your features. And then step five, repeat. So if it's not good enough, you go uh, kind of go back to the first step, try to understand the data a bit more. If you understand it to the fullest of your capabilities, maybe you want to go back to the second step where you brainstorm features and then go on from there. So this is where definitely where domain knowledge really uh, comes in because these kind of will aid you. So definitely if you're given a problem where you're kind of lacking the, the domain knowledge, you definitely want to do some research, consult potentially an expert domain, um, an expert in that domain um, or uh, see what their blogs are and go from there. So then what you guys probably seeing is how do I start? How do I start kind of um, start this feature engineering process? So I feel a lot of you guys might have not started the Kaggle competition and this is why I concluded this slide. So, so how do I start? So definitely kind of think as a human, put yourself in like the model shoes and think of what features you think will make a successful prediction. So definitely if I'm uh, trying to predict a cardiovascular disease, potentially using um, data that pertains a country or a province um, kind of 
respiratory, how well is that province doing in terms of respiratory um, function, it potentially uh, will aid the prediction in that. Um, another example is potentially, um, well, for me, sports guy, but um, again, maybe for basketball, how tall you are will de definitely um, aid you to towards uh, how good is this player, um, how potentially skilled. So then another step, would be you can build the work on top of others through published papers, blogs, or source code. So definitely you can search through a machine learning competition such as Kaggle and see somewhat of a similar um, kind of problem that you have and try to see what they did and try to implement it into your competition. And then don't feel like you're constrained by kind of the data set that you have. Definitely try to use um, open source data and try to include that into your data set or just generate new ones. So now we're trying to, we're going to be dealing with categorical data. So consider the following data set and we're trying to encode the dog breed kind of feature. So kind of to reiterate, these are called our feature. Well, these will be our feature names and which contains each feature and then each row would be an instance, except like the first row. So um, one way is that we, for each kind of dog species, we associate that with a certain unique integer. And, and that is called um, ordinal encoding. So then, this is an example of what potentially um, what it would look like. But an issue of that is that <clears throat> we feed this inside our algorithm, and it may try, it may infer that this dog species is twice as dog species as the other. So that's definitely not what we want to do in this case. As you can see, our last num uh, our last dog species in our kind of small data set is four, and then our first one would be one. So is the fourth kind of dog species. So in this case, it would be German Shepherd. Is a German Shepherd four times as dog uh, as a dog breed or species as a beagle? We want to want that would be no. So an alternate approach would be one hot encoding. So basically, it's pretty much an indicator variable where we have uh, uh, each species would be on as a new feature. And then in order to indicate that species, we would put a one and then a zero for as not being that species. And as you can see, for our first row, we can tell that it was a beagle just because it's a one in the in the beagle kind of spot and a zero for the other spots. Same thing with the bulldog and the poodle and the German shepherd. With this kind of approach, it where we kind of avoid the problem that we're doing with ordinal encoding, where we're not trying to tell our model that this do certain dog breed is is four times as dog species as the other. So this is a great way <clears throat> when you have categorical data that have like a nominal type, which means they don't have any difference between them. This is a great way for you to encode this categorical data. So for the ordinal encoder, it's great when you have data that has different differences. So such as kind of different shirt sizes where you have small, medium, extra small, all that. So definitely an ordinal encoder would be a great fit for that. So next, what we will be dealing with is numeric data. So before I go on, um, with categorical data, these are not the only two. So during my research, I did find some other um, 
categorical um, encoders. So definitely I encourage you guys to do your research and see what other um, what other uh, categorical data encoders include. So one thing was like a feature hasher. So basically when you have a large set of categories, you definitely don't want to store like a, each unique data because definitely it can hold um, some sort of um, definitely a computational cost in terms of storage. So one idea is just to use a hash of it and we don't really store it. So then during runtime, we run the hash on this certain species and then we feed that to our model. So we there's also good and bad with, with this approach. So then I encourage you guys to see um, what are the good and what are the bad. And also there's frequency encoding where you code for that particular category. How often does it appear? So yeah, I'll leave it at that. So feature scaling. So let's say from our previous example, we have age and weight and then certain algorithm. Um, and when there are features are isolated, they can't, it's not really fair or correct to judge these two kind of features because their scaling can be widely different. So let's say age will be kind of widely different in terms of kind of the distribution of the data compared to weight. And definitely depending on the algorithm you choose, um, it can it can definitely have drastic effects in terms of performance. And also, um, <clears throat> sorry. Um, so this is why you would want to use feature scaling where you kind of change the distribution of the data into like a scale um, kind of into a scale that uh, into like a set of kind of features where they're kind of comparable. So definitely if you take in stats or will be taking stats, you've definitely kind of seen an example of it. So we'll see our um, feature scalers. So the first one is kind of the standard scaler. So I'll kind of explain what kind of each of them are doing. So pretty much the difference between each and every scalar is how they deal with outliers. So definitely more, um, definitely some uh, scalars would be affected by outliers more than others. So for the first one, we have the standard scalar. So pretty much XI just represent like a, certain, um, for an instance of that like feature. So in this case, it will be like the age, and let's say our first, the beagle age for our first kind of animal is, is a beagle and its age is 10. So we first calculate the mean of that feature. So let's say it's 20. So then 10 minus 20 will be a negative number. And then we kind of divide it by the standard deviation. So then next we kind of use is the minimax scalar where we use the, the min and the max of kind of our data set of our feature where we just subtract our our instance of that feature xi minus or the min of our kind of feature and then all divided by the difference between our max and our min and then the robust scalar so this one is pretty much um what it get, gets its name is that it uses the interquartile range, which is like the so Q1 would be like 25%, like the data point at 25% of our kind of our whole feature kind of distribution. And then Q3 would be 75%. So we're using the interquartile range. So just uh, kind of the the range from Q1 to Q3 and we're using that. So this is why um, it's kind of robust because it uses in between the range. So it doesn't take the whole entire data set. It is to 25% to 75%. So this kind of makes it robust to um, out outliers because our outliers would kind of be on our extremes. 
So it will be probably over our Q4 and Q1. So next, we're going to be uh, discussing computable features and what they are pretty much kind of you perform some kind of computation on an existing feature and using that as an input. So you kind of already seen example of this, like such as a BMI, which is body mass index, where they, I believe the formula is we got or the mass divided by the height squared. So this is kind of an example of, uh, of a computable feature where we're kind of generating a new feature that gives us additional information about it. So this encodes domain knowledge about the problem and the data set. And these are also called interaction kind of features. So definitely we can use either one kind of feature. So let's say, um, like I said earlier, um, we let's if we had a skewed data set, we can potentially perform a computable feature on it where we use the logarithmic of that feature to kind of centralize it to a normal distribution data set. And um, yeah, so this will definitely require domain knowledge. Uh, so definitely you want to know why you're doing a certain operation and what additional feature that you gain, well, insight that you gain from computing these features. So next is feature engineering with dates. So you've kind of already seen it through Emea's workshop where she kind of extracts the days, the months, the years, the quarters and the, like kind of the you can also use time elapsed. So these these are certain days of the month and or a particular year because since our data set um, is only within kind of how much it was collected. So that was June 1st, I believe. So our data set, you couldn't really use years, but potentially if this virus does continue to next year, um, in use after that may be a feature you want to include. So then there is another feature called lag features. And what this kind of entails is that you use past values of the target value as features. So if we have, let's say we have five days, you can potentially use the one the day before it as a potential feature to predict it. So then that would mean pretty much our data set is shifted towards one day in advance and that kind of new shifted kind of um, target value kind of feature will be our new feature. So definitely I'll explain more in our when I get to the Kaggle portion. Um, so yeah. So then we got the ro rolling window feature. So this is kind of calculating some kind of statistic based on past value. So an example is of this will be like the rolling mean. So pretty much you take the average of the past seven days and you use that as a feature to, to try to predict your target value. So then uh, our last one is the expanding window, expanding window feature. So this kind of feature kind of takes in account all past value into uh, into account. So this would use everything you kind of use you've seen up until as a feature. So definitely an another example will be like the mean of all the values you've seen. So yeah. So coming to an end, so we will, I would like to give a shout out to our sponsor, CPA Ontario. So they're kind of providing us some funding and definitely some of the portion of the money uh, will be going to the competition. And the, got, got, uh, the company that worked with us to create our logo is Adam Vinatieri Designs. So definitely if you've got any questions, 
um, go to the website to look for more information. So then next up, we got ML memes. So definitely it's the 21st century. We all love memes. You know, I definitely want to share some of the memes that I liked. Maybe you guys will have a laugh. So we got, if you remember Spider-Man, the OG Spider-Man. We got Uncle Ben. So with many features comes great feature selection. Maybe you guys have a laugh. Maybe the next one, I'll have a better show of the next one. So this one is kind of uh, can happen. So you've been feature engineering for weeks and you got no improvement in the in, in the performance. So definitely feature engineering is it can you can it's not like a guarantee. You just got to keep at it and hopefully you can come up with better features to try to predict your model. Deep learning. This one I would say is the best because you know deep learning under the, the sea or under a, like a body of water. That's the one I really laughed at. And then this one I would say the least funniest. So machine learning enthusiasts and then the ones who actually care about the math behind it. So maybe that might be you and maybe uh, anyone else. And yeah, so this is gonna, this is the end. But now we're gonna uh, we're gonna head to Kaggle. So before I move on, is there any questions? No. Oh, so call. Um, why do one? hot encoding just the efficiency so we want to again um encode to the data um in, in, into our model that um not that we don't want to the difference between two categorical data we want to they're all on the kind of the same scale so hopefully you understand that it's like if you had different breeds we every breed is is pretty much the same. We just want to indicate it, it, indicate that it's that certain breed that you're presented with to the model, rather than this breed is like has a value of six, and then this breed is a value of twelve. So then that would somewhat mean that the other breed would be double as much dog breed as the other. So hopefully that makes sense. If not, I'll definitely um, link you to some resources for you guys to better understand. So definitely, um, overall, almost all the, um, from what I understand, the all the machine learning kind of in terms of like deep learning frameworks or SKLearn all have some sort of implementation of these kind of techniques, and I'll show you in a bit. Or any of oh, I'm on the one at the top. Shoot. Sit at. This is uh I don't see the tab. Oh mean this one? Okay. Uh, okay. So we'll move on. So editing. So now we're on to the feature engineering kind of portion in terms of real world kind of implementation. So what we first do is kind of <clears throat> we import the necessary libraries that we would need. So we would need NumPy, Pandas. We don't need Matplotlib, but something nice to have. We don't need this guy, but we do need standard scalar and one hot encoder. And then we don't need Seaborn. 
and we'll be using a linear regression model for kind of the see if our feature engineering um, code works. And let's get started. And then I'll later explain what these are. It just so that it's our our kind of feature engineering is within a, a data pipeline where it goes from one transformation to another. So the first kind of this portion of the code, I'm just creating a data frame. So this is similar to our example that you guys witnessed in the slides where you got a dog breed, you got the age, you got the weight, you got the sex, you got the height, and then you got the intelligence. But I did add a few more and we're trying to predict life expectancy. So then let's see what it looks like. I'm just going to run it. So we press this button. It's going to run. And there we go. There's a, this is what our data frame looks like. So we know that we have a few categorical data. So let's try to run it and see what our model picks up. And like I said, it will not work because you got, well, our models can't, for the most part, except if you're using cat boost, um, it won't automatically encode these features. So you kind of have to do the work yourself. So we'll start with ordinal encoding. So the first line is is our kind of is our encoding scheme for the, this ordinal encoder. So the one the, the feature that we'll be encoding is intelligence. So you guys um, could probably imagine this will kind of fall under the ordinal kind of scaling. Um, type in in categorical data, where you can have you can be below average, average or above average, and this does have some sort of magnitude among these features. Where above average is certainly more in the intelligence of average and below average. So what I do here on the second line is I create a ordinal encoder object and then as a parameters I pass in a an array so you can definitely have more than one kind of feature in, in inside this encoder so this is you kind of feeding in to this ordinal encoder your your coding scheme so then for the next line we get our results so we use the fit transform function so what what that, what's that doing? It's kind of doing two things at once. Where we we'll first try to will fit our data set, and what does fit mean? It means it's just learning from our training data set of how to encode, but basically it already does through uh, our encoding scheme. So then it will transform our feature, which is intelligence, column and it will turn back it will you later see the what will what will it return back um and yeah so if you ever want to double check of what are the categories you're using you can just use the method um i don't believe it's a method I'm sorry it's the attribute dot categories underscore so then using that it will just print out the categories they're using. And then for the next step, we're just changing the, the kind of the shape of our what we got into a 1D array so that we can nicely print out our ordinal encoder. So let's run this. As you can see, first line, you get our categories, something that we expect. And then and that's a 1D array. And then we get our kind of transform, um, our transform feature. 
So as you can see, we start from zero and below average, that's the lowest point. So then we go to average, which is one, and then above average is two. So next will be binary encoding. So basically we're doing the same thing where we're using ordinal encoding, but we just have two categories. So we got, it doesn't really matter per se, like where it's the order, since you already have two categories, it doesn't matter. Um, so kind of similar to the code above us, we have our encoding scheme, male and female. So then we use the same one encoder and object where we create it. And we use the fit transform and then there's the same thing. So pretty much copy paste and then just use different, um, a different feature. So let's see what the produce. And we get an error. It's probably says I press enter right before. There you go. So now we get a similar result to what we had where male is zero because it was the first one in our encoding scheme and female is one. So now let's get to one hot encoding. So this is where we will actually see. So there is two ways of doing this. So um, pandas has a way of doing it and through the pd.git dummies. And what that does is exactly what one hot encoding does where you have an array and then you have a one to indicate that this instance is that certain variable and then zeros across. So let's see what we get. So as you can see, we got something similar, but PDs pandas will actually include that as a new call, like a new column where all oh, each kind of new breed is will be a zero or a one. But one hot encoding kind of just returns that vector itself. So then we get to feature scalar. Um, so pretty much what we saw where X is, for example, the instance, this is mu, which is our mean, and then we divided by our standard deviation. So if you haven't, if you don't know what they are, you definitely encounter this in your first year staff class or any sort of staff class. So pretty much what I'm doing is I'm using a standard scalar. We, we, we get that from sklearn.preprocessing. So definitely if you're ever unsure of how to use a certain um, kind of object, you can definitely go to their website and see how they will work. So pretty much every encoder pretty much has this fit underscore transform function where it kind of does first tries to fit towards your data set and then transforms it. So in this case, I'm, uh, I'm using standard scalar on the age and the weight. And let's see what happens. And there we go. So then next will be kind of feature interaction. So these are computable features. So um, what I did first was create a variable called height squared. So pretty much the square height of our height column. So what I did was use the, the numpy.power function and pretty much square everything in that column. So then using that column, I was able to get some sort of BMI, um, a BMI feature where I use the weight and then the, the squared height and produce that. So then what you can also do is get the difference between the height and weight 
and they get the sum between the height and the weight. We'll later see how that works. And there we have it, a new generated features. So definitely, um, that's something you guys can do for um, when you're generating features of using basic arithmetic operation um, to get to generate new features. Next. So pretty much we're going to put everything together. So what I like to do is using the make a pipeline. I kind of generate a data pipeline of my like my features and why this is pretty useful to know is that you can use this to generate multiple kind of data um, sets of data in terms of kind of feature selection. So you can definitely encode some features and not and see how well that for uh, how well does that help your model or not. And then this is where and a way that you guys can kind of do this uh, kind of process pretty fast. And yeah, so pretty much um, it's pretty similar what we did where we got our encoding scheme and we create the encoder object. So then um, I pretty much have an array of what each encoder, what what features that each encoder will be used for. So for example, our ordinal, what attribute will it use or features I should say, will be the intelligent feature within our data set. For the binary, it's gonna be sex. For the one hot encoding, it's gonna be dog breed. And lastly, for our numeric attribute or feature would be our age and our weight. So what we do is you first create a numeric um, pipeline where this will kind of contain everything that will be used within our numeric functions, I mean your numeric features, and then we create a full column transformer. So basically it's pretty much a pair of the encoder and then the attributes that will be used uh, on our data set and we get a simplified kind of version of what we did in the previous steps. And then what we did, you can you still use the fit transform, but we kind of, what I did was split it into two parts where you first fit the model and then we got the transform. So definitely something you do have to note is that you would never, you always, fit underscore transform on the training set, but you will you always transform on the testing set. So that's very important because when you fit, you're learning what relevant features do you have to change in order to get to what you want to produce. While in the testing set, it should be similar to what you have in the training set, but it's on on scene data. So definitely um, It's on unseen data, so that's why you want to transform it. So, um, sorry about this. Um, <clears throat> so this is why you wouldn't want to fit because you it would it would still produce the same result, but it's not the general ways of doing things, and it may be erroneous. Um, so next, and lastly. We're going to see if our model works. So in the beginning, it didn't work. But now it should work. And then we get our prediction. So before we had an error, but now we don't. So we're doing something good. So, that, um, so feature engineering with dates. So here's a list of when you're giving a date time kind of object what kind of features you can generate. So you can kind of extract, like I said, the year, the month, the day, even the weekday. So that might be informative. So in this step, I kind of generate my data frame. Um, I kind of use a random uh, 
random generated data frame. So for the first step, I generate from dates from July 1st, 2015 to 20 um, December, well, the last day of December of this year. And then I get the size of it, which is how many instances in that data frame. And then I use this uh, mp.random.seed. So this is to ensure that um, everyone kind of gets the same result. So then I generate uh, data. So this data would kind of represent in our Kaggle competition, potentially our the number of cases, the death and recoveries. And let's see how it looks like when it runs. So there we have it. We got first some info. So this, I really like using the info method uh, when I have a data set. So it gives me a indication of what the data set looks like. So this is really important where you want to see what each date that the data frame kind of interprets it as. So as you can see, it currently uh, interprets our date column as a date time object. So this is how we, we would, um, if it's not in that date time object format, um, it can be problematic because then you can't get the dates that you would want. So then we got our date, which is interpreted as an integer. So the non-null count is really important because you definitely want to see how many null values you have in your data set because you will get an error if you do have null values when you're trying to encode something because you're going to, how can you can, how will your encoder kind of encode something it hasn't seen before, which is a null value. So as you can see, we don't have any null values because um, that's the number of entries. So each entry in this case represent what I've been saying in instance. So we got 2,192. And then for each column, we got the same number. So that means we don't have any um, null values. And then uh, briefly pr uh, print out the head um, where there's a few examples of uh, the data set that we have. So <clears throat> whenever you want to, whenever you want to generate a new feature, you generally do this in, in this kind of format where on the left side, you have the, uh, the data frame and then in bracket and then Inside the bracket, you would want the name. It will be equal to some sort of right-hand operand. So in this case, we use the year, and then we use the month, the day, um, the week, and so on. So you can definitely use other operations, such as seeing if a um, if a certain value is greater than or equal to something. So that's what I use here to determine if it's a weekend, I see if it's greater than five or greater or equal to five. So pretty much um, the week, I, I believe the weekday um, operation will give you the kind of what day of the week it is. So I believe if it's starting from, it believes it starts from zero to denote Monday and Tuesday and go on and on. So five and six are, um, are Saturday and Sunday. So um, that would denote if it's the weekend or not. And then if it's a month start, we got its own operation dt.month underscore start. So then let's see what that looks like. And there we have it. So maybe these are some of the features you may want to include. Probably not month or year because our data set is not is not encompassing reoccurring months or year, but maybe eventually it will. Hopefully not. So then, what also you can do is 
um, you can calculate how many days have ha occurred after a certain date. And what would you use there is the minus operator. So I have a random date, 2015, uh, the seventh month uh, on the second day. And I just subtract that. Um, this probably don't need. No. So days, uh, I don't even need this. So what I'm doing in this case is using, subtracting how many days has happened from today and those dates, and then we'll see what happens. And then you'll see there, we got, it should be like descending, and there we have it. 2,124 days since 20, the first day of 2015. So then we got leg features. So in order to produce leg features, we would want to use the shift operator. So what that does is pretty much shift our data up one. And you would see in this case, the first, the first kind of row would be empty because it doesn't have a day before. So as you can see, um, each leg, um, if we denote leg one, that'll be like one day in the like events or delay, well, the day before, I should say. And as you can see, our first row doesn't have any feature. If we kind of continue down this path, let's see. We do. We use leg two. You should see something similar, but the first two days are missing, and you can keep them going on and on and on and on. So then we can use this kind of what I've talked about, which is the rolling mean, where you use like the average rolling mean for seven days, and then that's and why I used tail in this case. So head will print the first few rows for the first few, oh, first few rows of the data set, and then tail does like the opposite where it prints the last few rows. So if I did head in this case, you wouldn't see, you will see null values. And then as you can see, null, 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 and up until the last four days. Um, so then we got expanding mean, where it encompasses the same data of like everything it's seen before it, and then there. So then lastly, or is some there are some open source libraries. I haven't delved into them, but um, TS Fresh. So these are um, libraries that automatically compute some features. It could be something in, in tice, um, intriguing to look into you and to look into for the competition. So something like TS Fresh um, automatically calculates a large number of time series characteristics. And there, um, so definitely, um, I would encourage you to look into that. There's also feature tools and you guys are um, more than uh, free to use those open source libraries. And that concludes my presentation. So is there any questions? Hopefully I'll mention them. I don't see any questions yet. But All there's right. a few second delay between us and the attendees, so. No worries. Yeah, that was a good event. Very interesting. Um, can you send me the link to this Kegel um, notebook so I can email it to everyone? Sounds good. All right.
Mm -hmm. I don't see any questions coming in, but you never know. So maybe I'll go on, on a little rant. So definitely we didn't see every. Oh, go, go. <laughs> you you want to say anything? You want to say something, Kyle? Oh, no. No? <laughs> it's OK. OK. Go ahead. So um, we did. We definitely uh, didn't touch all feature engineering techniques. So then maybe a question that pops up is how do you encode per se a, a text where you have like a sentence? Let's say you have a sentiment analysis kind of problem where you're trying to classify whether this review is a positive review or a negative review. So there's definitely encodes for that. So the first thing that popped up to my mind is um, bag of words and what that is it's similar to um, kind of one hot encoding but um, you kind of see how many times a word um, appears in that like sentence for for the whole entire data set so <clears throat> uh, a great model uh, to use in that case will be naive Bayes um, another kind of feature engineering technique is term frequency. Uh, well, that'll be big words, but inference documentation frequency, where um, one a, a problem with bag of words is that it could have, uh, let's say, um, of a, um, let's see, I'm trying to think of a, so a certain word can be, so you, so pretty much, what I'm trying to say is inference uh, do, a document frequency is is good for when there's somewhat of an outlier because it, it accounts for words that it may appear in a certain corpus or a certain instance a lot, but not in others. So that then that might somewhat disturb the model a bit, where like it occurs a lot into this one, but not this one. So it might think that it does occur a lot, where in actuality it doesn't. So that's why that model, um, that encoder would be better. And then you also want to remove stop words. So things, those are words that don't convey any semantic kind of um, information. So it'd be the, and you kind of name it there. So you want to want to remove those. So that'll be a, another feature engineering technique. And then using word embeddings, where I won't dive into it, but those that's a way of of uh, kind of including semantics into your model. And yeah, any questions? No. Um, I'm not seeing anyone with questions, so. I think that's um, will be it then. We All can right. hang around for a few minutes. Um, are you able to hop in Discord after this, uh, Darren, or no? Yeah, I'll definitely be on Discord. Sounds good. OK. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, so the other thing is this Thursday is the introduction to scientific Python, which was supposed to happen uh, last Sunday, but we had to move it. So you guys are welcome to attend that one. And then um, other than that, I think that's it. And then my dog is making loud noises. <laughs> um, but yeah, cool. I think that will be it for tonight then. Thank you so much for everyone attending. Alrighty, I'm going to end.